Okay, let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for the spirit of holiness. Help us to understand this aspect of your spirit that lives in us. That we will be separated unto you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Okay, so um, we started on Monday looking at the background to the seven spirits of God. And um, so far we've looked at prophecy, that is the spirit of revelation, wisdom and revelation, and then the spirit of truth. And today we have the spirit of holiness. Let's open our Bibles to Romans chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. Romans chapter 1, verses 1 to 4, the spirit of holiness. And another person open to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. Okay, someone read Romans chapter 1, verse 1 to 4. Romans chapter 1, verse 1 to 4. Paul, a born servant of Jesus Christ, is called to be an apostle separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets. In, in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead. Amen. Amen. So declared by power according to the Spirit of holiness. Hallelujah. So the spirit of holiness So the spirit of holiness has got something to do with our Amen. Amen. Declared with power according to the spirit of holiness to be the son of God. Hallelujah. So the spirit of holiness comes with what? Power. Okay? So take note of that. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 14. Live at peace with all men. And be holy without holiness, no one can see God. Now we have established that the spirit of holiness comes with what? Power. Without holiness, you cannot see God. Means holiness brings you closer to God, who is the source of all power. And therefore, if you are holy, you have power. Holiness gives power. Do you understand? Yes. If you are not holy, you don't have power. You speak, the devil does not listen. The people that the devil listens to are the people that have power. Those people that have power are the people who are holy. You understand? Amen. Amen. 
So holiness gives power. Okay. Now, who is the source of all power? Now, before we go on to that, let's read Romans chapter 8 and the verse 8. Romans chapter 8 and the verse 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 8. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Amen. So then those who are in the flesh cannot what? Please God. So it's only those who are holy who can please God. It's only those who are holy who have power. Amen? And therefore, if you want to be a powerful Christian, you've got to be holy. A holy Christian is a powerful Christian. So that is why God gives us the spirit of holiness. Now, you must understand that all these spirits have their role in our lives as believers. For instance, with the spirit of truth, which I didn't say yesterday, the spirit of truth is the spirit that helps you to understand God's word. That helps you to read God's word with revelation. That helps you, that gives you insight into God's word. Without the spirit of truth, when you read God's word, God's word becomes like a newspaper article to you. Without the spirit, God's word, when you read it, is just wrong. It doesn't give you any revelation. It doesn't um, feed your spirit. And you don't understand God's word as you read it. So you become like the Ethiopian Enoch. And the Bible says that when Philip got close to the child, he asked the, the Holy Spirit asked him, ask him what if he understands what he's reading. So there was no understanding. Okay? And he says, I don't understand what I'm reading unless someone explains it to me. And the Bible says, Philip began to explain, expound scripture to him, helping him to understand that the lamb that was being sent to be slaughtered is Christ. So he expounded the word of God. And he was able to do that through the spirit of truth that gives revelation and understanding into God's word. Amen? Amen. Is there anybody here who still finds difficulty in reading God's word and not understanding it? You, you, still, you still struggle with that. Just, just let me know. You still struggle with that. You don't get the revelation in the word. You know? Okay, so we'll pray about that. And we all need to pray. I often pray for that because there are certain scriptures someone will quote and use for preaching and you take your Bible and look at it it's as if you have never read that passage before. So we all have to grow in that spirit of truth and revelation. Okay? There are levels. There are levels. And you always have to increase your level of understanding into God's word. Obviously, a level of a mature Christian is not the same as a level of a, a new believer. But the basic thing is that you have to grow in the understanding of God's word. Do you get what I'm saying? So your understanding into God's word should not be the same as it was last year. You should grow in the word. And it's the spirit of truth that gives that growth. So you get deeper revelation of who Jesus is. Jesus is the truth. And you need to get a deeper revelation of who Jesus is. That is why you need the spirit of truth. You understand? And this is the work of the Holy Spirit to help you see Jesus and get to know him and know him better. And always getting to know him better as the years go by. So do we get the idea behind it? Yeah. 
So that is what we're talking about. Now, who is the source of holiness? We say holiness, holiness. Without holiness, no one can see God. If you don't have holiness, you don't have power. Who is the source of holiness? First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. First Corinthians chapter 1 and the verse 30. Who is the source of holiness? Okay, someone to read for us. Who is the source of holiness? Who has become for us wisdom from God? That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Who has become what? Our righteousness. Who has become? Who has become our righteousness? And the next one. Holiness. And the next one. Redemption. Our redemption. So Jesus is our righteousness. Jesus is our holiness. Jesus Christ is our redemption. Right? So the source of holiness is Jesus Christ himself. And you can never be holy in your own strength until you link up with the Lord Jesus Christ. If you don't have any relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, you cannot be holy. Do you get what I'm saying? I remember those days when we wanted to become Christians. And then I would decide, today, I will watch my actions. I will make sure I don't sin today. Now you realize that the day that you say that you don't want to sin, and be holy so that you'll be pleased with yourself, even that is the day that you do the most silly things and foolish things. Then at the end of the day, when you're marking yourself, you become very disappointed in yourself. So, what you do is that you abandon the whole idea and you live your life. Because you are trying hard to be holy. You can only be holy when you are linked to the source of holiness. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And from Him flows the spirit of holiness. To make you holy. Now, the English translation of holiness uh, does not actually give us the, the biblical meaning, the word that is used in the biblical language. It does not give us the actual understanding of the language that is used in the Bible with regard to holiness. Now, the Old Testament is written in Hebrew. The New Testament in Greek. The Greek and Hebrew words used are not the same as the English translation or definition of holiness. So what is the definition of holiness? We're going back to the original language. What is it? What is that definition? In the Hebrew, the word used for holiness is kadosh. Kadosh. This is it. Now, holiness in Greek is hagios. So, Hagiosis, let me write it again. Hagiosis. For the Greek. Now, what does these two words mean in the biblical language? In Hebrew, Kadosh. 
means that something that is devoted or dedicated to a particular purpose. Kadosh, something which is devoted or dedicated. Devoted or what? Dedicated. Okay, so you, you, you see that in the Old Testament, vessels were dedicated and they became holy vessels in the temple. So you don't use those vessels for any other purpose except for the purpose for which God said they should use it for. You understand? You cannot take the cup in the temple and take it to your home to use. You will die. That cup that has been dedicated and made holy belongs to the temple of God. You don't touch it. The temple was holy. The tabernacle, if, when, if they were using the tabernacle, the tabernacle was holy. The ark of God was holy. You don't touch it. It means that that thing has been dedicated and devoted to God. Do you get it? So, I could say, I have dedicated this pen and devoted it to God. So, it's holy. The only thing that this pen will write will be when I'm writing about the things of God. Apart from writing about the things of God, I'm not going to use this pen for any other purpose. I cannot use it for my classroom work. I cannot use it to teach my children. I cannot use it for my own personal notes. I will only use this pen if I am doing something or writing something about God. So it becomes holy. It has been dedicated and devoted to a particular purpose. And that is the meaning of kadosh. Devotion. Commitment. Dedicated. For a particular purpose. Hagiosis, Greek, means separated unto God or set apart for God. Separated unto God or you have been what? Set apart for God. And that is the Greek meaning, Hagiosis, set apart. So holiness means basically a person who has been set apart. It means that that person is not honored. Okay? That person is not what? Honored. That person has been set apart. That person is unique among many. You are separated. So let my life now be separated unto thee, that I may be what I was born to be. Your life has got to be separated for you to be what God called you to be for that particular purpose. So you may call a priest a holy man because the priest is separated and dedicated to a particular purpose which is God's um, work. And he does no other job except doing God's work. So you say he's a holy man. In that sense. Do you understand? He's been separated, set apart to do that work. And therefore, if believers are separated, if believers are called out once, it means every believer is a holy person. You have been called out of the world. You have been separated from the world. 
Yes, you are in the world, but you are not of the world. That is what makes you holy. You understand? Okay, we are all human beings. We all live in Britain. But there are some people in Britain who are separated. And they are special. And the behavior that people expect from them, their manner, mannerisms and the things they do that people expect from them, people expect them to behave differently. Why is the expectation for those group of people different from the expectation of other people? Because they are royals. Because they are what? Royals. Therefore, Prince Charles, Prince William is not expected to speak in a certain way. It's not allowed. Do you understand? They are not supposed to present themselves to the public in a certain way. Why? Because they are separated. A certain level of expectation of behavior you know, is demanded from them by the public. Right? So, a comedian can come on TV and use the F word at random. Pam, 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 F word. <laughs> Prince Charles cannot come on TV and start using the F word. No. It's no. Do you understand? Now, you may argue, but is Prince Charles not a human being? Can he not falter? Can he also not use the F word? It's completely no. There is no compromise on that. He cannot do that. Do you understand? He cannot do that. You see, they will not lower the standards for him to do that. They won't. And so at times I wonder and think why some Christians think it's all right to do certain things. It's all right for the standard to be lowered for them so that they can also use the F word. You understand what I mean? Yeah. And when you question them, oh, but I'm also human. So if I use the F word, I use the No! And because they praise that standard, it has never happened that the queen will come and give a Christmas message on 25th. <laughs> On 25th December, and everyone is watching the Queen giving a Christmas message, and the Queen becomes vexed and starts using the F word of the British people. And in the new year, 2019, if you don't do this, I'll FF do that. <laughs> the Queen will never do that. Do you understand? She will never do that. And people are not going to say, oh, you see, people are not going to give us this. Oh, you see, the queen was so um, vexed with what was going on with Brexit, and she's so annoyed with the MPs and the Prime Minister. And so it's understandable that, you know, the queen used that language on TV because these MPs, we don't know whether they want to give up Brexit or they want to give up um, Britain. <laughs> brain, that's my own way. Either you brain or you Brexit. So the queen was frustrated and he started speaking like that. Have you ever heard that happen before? But have you seen pastors frustrated? And you see the sort of words coming out from the pulpit. And then we'll give excuse. Oh. Pastor of the you see, Pastor also is human. The church members so provoked him that the Holy Word started coming out. Jesus says, What is in your heart is what will come out. Abby, yes. what they hear is <laughs> what will what? So if you are that kind of Christian that anytime these words are coming out, please check your heart. Your heart is very dirty. What kind of person are you? What kind of heart do you, have you got? Stone? 
break it, make it soft, make it foam. Get a heart of foam. If it will never happen in the case of the queen, it should never happen in the case of the priest. It should never happen in the case of the Christian. You are separated and you have a spirit that has been given to you to help you to be separated. Holiness is a spirit. Abba! So if you are like, hey, I think this, I think that, then I know that you lack the spirit of holiness. You, you haven't got it. But you should have it because the Holy Spirit comes in his fullness. You understand? The Holy Spirit comes in his fullness. And you need to have a spirit of holiness. So in the New Testament, we see that God also called certain ministries, which is called the fivefold ministries. And the Bible makes us understand that these people have been set aside to train the people of God. That is a holy office. And he appointed some to be apostles and prophets and evangelists and teachers and pastors for the work of the ministry. That is a holy office you have been called into. You have been separated to do that work. So we see that in the Old Testament, Moses was a leader. Okay? Moses was called to be the leader of the people of Israel. His brother Aaron was called to be a priest by God. And the sister Miriam was also called to be a prophetess and a songwriter. Okay? Moses was what? what? Moses, leader. Aaron, priest. Priest. Miriam, prophetess. She's a prophetess. Okay. Now, something happened while these brother and sister were with Moses. Okay? Moses being the leader, did something that they, the two did not agree with. Okay? So these two spoke against Moses, the holy man. Now the Bible says that Upon all, you know, the people who were on the earth at that time, Moses was the most humble person. In any case, these two were older than him, anyway. Miriam was the one that was watching over him when he was put in a small basket and floating on the Nile. So probably, she thought because I'm the big sister, and this one is the big brother, and this big brother too, was the one that God said, okay, Moses, if you cannot talk, I'll get him to talk for you. So you become God, he becomes your prophet. And they went to it. At the point, these two spoke against their younger brother who was the leader. And God punished. God punished me. Now, the thing is, an office which is not for you, okay, if you have not been separated to a particular office, hmm? if you have not been separated to that office, don't try and operate in that office. It will bring a curse. Because there is a spirit of leadership. Listen carefully. There is a spirit that makes you a leader. There is a spirit that makes you a priest. And there is also a spirit that makes you a prophetess. You see that in the Old Testament, if someone wasn't a priest and tried to perform a function of the priest, God seriously looked, you know, at that sort of behavior with uh, disdain and did not entertain it. Who did that happen to? That happened to King Saul. 
if if you you know your Old Testament Bible uh, well, King Saul had to wait for Samuel to come and offer sacrifices. He couldn't wait, so he decided to do the sacrifice himself. And because he did that, God rejected him. Are you getting me? Because there is a spirit that goes with priesthood. And Samuel was separated by the spirit of holiness, devoted and committed to that office, and he alone was authorized to do that sort of sacrifice. Saul was a king. He was anointed to be king. He was separated and devoted to be king. And Samuel could not become king. Do you understand? But if you decide to cross over from your office into somebody's office, you are bringing a curse upon yourself. Because the sort of spirit that that person has and is doing the work that he's doing, if you try to imitate his work, you'll be disgraced. So there are special callings. Well, you may say special callings with special anointings. Now we know that these anointings are spirits. And it's the spirit of holiness that sets a person apart for a specific what? Job or purpose. You understand it? So, but this happens a lot of times in churches. Sadly, because maybe we don't have this basic understanding. Someone is a very good Sunday school teacher, teaching very well. Someone came a long time ago, and by mistake, they made that person the coordinator of the Sunday school. But you see, the person that they made coordinator for the Sunday school has got nothing about him or her which is Sunday school. Now, the real Sunday school teacher comes. But you know, as human as we are, because we have been placed there, we refuse to accept that the new person that has come has got better qualities to become the Sunday school coordinator or teacher than me. And therefore, she's got the spirit, okay, that can take care of children. So let me step down and give him that position so that that department will flourish. Because she's got that anointing, that spirit upon her that makes that ministry what? Flourish. When the person comes, mm -hmm. I'm the leader. I'm still there. That is what is affecting God's work. You know? We don't understand the anointings which is upon us. We don't understand the spirit of holiness which has separated someone to do a specific job. If we have that understanding that there is a spirit behind that office, we will step aside and stick to our lane and let the other person also stick to his or her lane. You get what I mean? Hmm? So, let's say you were made the Sunday school leader because at that time there wasn't anyone to fill that position. Right? Get that understanding. When the right person comes, hand over. That is how we do it. And the Lord will bring the right person because the Lord sees a need there. It doesn't mean the Lord has rejected you, but the Lord will want you to also focus in the area that He has called you so that you also flourish in that area. So the Lord has seen a need. We said, pray that the Lord will bring workers for the harvest. Now the workers have come. What's your 
problem. What's your problem? Now the workers have come. Oh, thank God, now a worker has come. Okay. Worker A, now take over this. Whilst we're waiting for you to come, for the Lord to bring you, I was doing this. But since you came, I've seen that you are very good in this thing. Do it. So that I can do this. It's rare to find, you know, some of these things happening. So people find themselves in the wrong office, the wrong positions. Amen? Amen. Now, We should not forget that using this example, before Moses became the leader, the Lord had trained him 40 years in Egypt, and then the Lord trained him 40 years in the desert, making 80 years. You see the amount of investment God has put in Moses. Okay? So you cannot just stand up because you are the older brother to speak against his leadership. You understand? Before God places someone in a position, God has invested time, energy, resources in that person. 40 years in Egypt as a prince. 40 years on the desert, making 80 years. Don't just do anything by heart. There's a spirit attached to it. Okay? Now, still using the ministry of Moses, what is the spirit that rises up against the spirit of holiness? When someone is separated to do a job, there's a spirit that comes against you. Okay? People see a particular anointing upon your life, they see that you are good at this, you are separated to do that job, there will be a spirit that will come against you. Okay? There will be a spirit that will do what? For me, there will be spirits that will come against you because they know that you have been separated by the spirit of holiness to do that particular job. Now, Moses was called to be a leader. Apart from Miriam and Aaron, when the enemy tried that and it didn't work because Moses was very humble, he hardly talked. The enemy turned his eyes on the congregation. And we're going to read that story. So let's go to Numbers chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. Numbers chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. Let's see the people that came to Moses. One and two. Now Korah, the son of Isha, the son of Kohan, the son of Levi, with Beta, and Nabiram, the son of Elia, and on the son of Peleg, Son of Reuben took them, and they rose up before Moses with some of the children of Israel, two hundred and fifty leaders of the congregation, represent representatives of the congregation, men of renown. Men of what? Renown. When you read further, okay, read verse three for me. Let me see if I can catch what they say. Yeah. They gathered together against Moses and Aaron mm -hmm. and said to them, mm -hmm. You think too much of God yourselves, mm -hmm. for all the congregation is holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Why then do you exalt yourself above as, um, the assembly of the Lord? So when Moses heard it, Okay, so let's end on verse 3. Hey, Moses, you take too much. 
we are also holy. They said, the whole congregation is holy. And what they were saying was true. Do you know why Israel was holy? Israel was holy because Israel, among all the tribes in the world, God chose them and separated them unto himself. So Israel became what? Holy as a group. So among all the people in the world, Israel was holy because they were separated and dedicated and devoted to God. So what they were saying was true. But among the holy group, they were holy of holies. <laughs> if you get what I mean. Yes. Okay? So they came and they were like, why? The whole congregation is holy. Why? Why is it that you and Aaron alone have taken too much upon yourself? Now you should remember in the first place, Moses protested heavily in Exodus chapter 3 when God called him to go and deliver his people. He gave all the excuses to God that made him very unqualified to do that job. So Moses did not put himself there. Those guys did not get it. Moses was not the sort of person who was power seeking, power drunk, and wanted to impose himself on people. Moses was not that type. Moses wanted his quiet life to stay away, especially from Egypt. And therefore, when God was calling him, he gave every possible excuse not to go. And the last excuse he gave was that, uh, God, no, I stop. And uh, I cannot talk. <laughs> he was a stammer. Uh, I cannot talk. Now you see, a stammer will be the least person you think of when it comes to leadership and speaking. Standing before the public and speaking. You will think that you need an orator, someone who is eloquent. And can speak to the people and capture the hearts of people. We need a leader to go and bring us a stammer. Why is a stammer going to say, my fellow people? <laughs> what kind of God is this? But you see, when it comes to God, what He does, at times you look at it physically. And it is very nonsense right. and it's foolishness to men. But in the eyes of God, yes. you are somebody. Yes. yes, you are Samra, but you are the one that the Lord delights in. Yes. Remember, you remember David? You remember David? Yes. Ah! Samuel went to Jesse's house with the oil in a, in a horn or whatever he was carrying, a flask or whatever horn. He went there and even David's father, his own father, ah, his own father, when Samuel went, he arranged the, the older ones, those who were take tall, muscular, and muscle. And even the prophet Samuel was deceived. When he saw one of David's brothers, he looked at him and said, Ah, looking at his height and the way thick tall he is, this might be the king of Israel. The moment Samuel thought that, God intervened and he said, Hey, don't look at the outward appearance. Yes. Never make that mistake. Because I, God, I look at the heart. It's not because you are tall and handsome, you should become the pastor. And I'm short and pot belly, I shouldn't be the pastor. God doesn't look at height. God looks at the heart. You see, if your heart is right, 
That is all that God cares about. Yeah. It doesn't matter how men describe you. Men may describe you as a stammerer. You see, when, when David came, when when they went and called David from the from the farm, he was taking care of sheep. And when he came, Samuel said, Bring him until he can't. I'm not sitting down. The prophet was waiting. When they brought him, the Bible said that he was ruddy and had got uh, bright eyes also. He gave me a description. That description did not matter. Yes. That is the physical appearance of David. But God was looking for a man who had the heart of worship. Amen. And he chose David. Okay? Now these people come to Moses and they tell him, you are taking too much. Why? You and your brother. Why? Does Israel belong to you? <laughs> so that spirit of rebellion is called the spirit of Korah. The spirit of what? The Korah spirit. It's the spirit of rebellion. And trust me, anytime you are placed in a position by God, that spirit will come up against you. They will challenge your authority. Okay? There are some of them who will not challenge you directly, but they will show you disrespect. They will be defiant. They will disobey your commands. Hmm? You tell them, I'm the prayer leader. Today I'm calling for prayer meeting. Everyone should come. You don't come. You, you phone him. Oh, sister, today you didn't come for prayer meeting. I was busy. Rude attitudes. The devil will make sure that you face the music. You will suffer in that department. The people that you need to support you, he will, he will put standing blocks in their way. You will make them rude towards you. You know, he will make them rebel against you. To see whether you will leave the prayer department or you will stay. But there should be one thing about you. That should everyone leave, I'll be the only man to stand. I'll be one man intercessor for the church. The rest, they can sleep in their homes and enjoy their beds. If you call for prayer meetings, they won't come. If you call for intercessory meetings, they won't come. Stand alone. After all, God says, I look for a man. God did not say, I look for men. God is just looking for one person. And God will move and work. You see, you need to get that mentality. You don't always have to depend on people. Because people will either rebel, betray you, gossip about you, speak against you, things that you have done and things that you haven't done, the enemy will work through them to rebel against you. But anytime you see that against your office, you should know that it is a spirit of rebellion, the spirit of Korah. But if you know that you did not put yourself there, but it's God that placed you there, stand firm. Very soon, God will bring the right people who will stand with you and make that department strong and flourishing. You understand? Yes. Now, when people rebel against you, what do you do? That is the next question we want to consider. When people are defiant, when people question your authority, what do you do? They come to you, you, what do you think? Who do you think you are? This, that, 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 that. What do you do? Here's the next question. Numbers chapter 16, verses 4 to 7. What did Moses do when the people came? When the 250 people, there were 250 people. Not one person. How many? 250. You, when you are doing something at church and even only one person comes to you. 
we are running to pastor. 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 <laughs> if you want to give pastor a heart attack, just one person stood up against him. Pastor, I'm tired. I'm tired. Pastor, I'm not doing this job anymore. Pastor, please give it to somebody else to do it. Why? Uh, this person, Moses had 250 people that came to him. It's like a whole congregation that stood up against him. How are you going to convince all these 250 people, one after the other, and explain why you became a leader and how God called you and the vision you saw and the bushfire and you went to Egypt? And how are you going to convince all of them? Hmm? How are you going to do that? So please, when people rise up against your office, there may be one or two or three in the congregation. That should be easy to deal with. That should be easy to work. Compared to 250 on one man. In fact, even some of us, no one has said anything. No one in the church has said anything. They just work in and then they will start looking around. Then suspicion will tell them. You see, the way they are looking at you, they are not happy with your position. Then they come to Pastor. Pastor, I don't think I can do this job. Why? And this sister, as I was passing by, she looked at me some kind way. She, it's just a look. She hasn't said anything. She just looked. You are complaining. Hey! What if she has said something? So that tells us that we should focus on God and work in our separate offices. What do you do? Let me from the verse 4 to 7. Verse 4 to 7. Mm -hmm. So when Moses heard this, he fell on his face and he spoke to Korah and all his company, saying, Tomorrow morning the Lord will show who is his mm. and who is holy and will cause him to come near to him. That one whom he chose, he will cause to come near to him. Mm. Do this, take senses. Korah and all your company, put fire in them and put incense in them before the Lord tomorrow. And it shall be that the man whom the Lord chooses is the only one. You take too much upon yourselves, you sons of Levi. Amen. Amen. And you see, the sad, the sad thing is that Moses was from the tribe of Levi. And when ending his statement, he said, You sons of Levi, you take too much. So it is his own people. Let even other tribes do it. Like from the tribe of Issachar or the tribe of Zebulon or other tribes. His own people rose up against him. The first thing you have to do when people rise up against you, one, submit it to God. One, submit it to God. Moses fell down on his face. It means he submitted the situation to God. Submit it to God. Two, inquire about what God wants to do. Inquire from God. Inquire from who? You see, most of the time when people face challenges in ministry, instead of inquiring from God, they turn to people. And this is what this person is saying. Do you think I should leave the prayer ministry? <laughs> Do you think I should leave the singing ministry? This is what the choir leader is saying. Do you think I should leave? 
This is what the Sunday school coordinator is saying. Do you think I should leave? Don't ask people. Ask God. God, this is what the leader is saying. Do you think I should leave? Ask God what he wants to do. Hmm? Don't ask people. But we do that most often times. We will talk to everybody except God. <laughs> and everybody in the church will hear our case except God. Talk to God. Submit the situation into his hands and talk to him. And he will solve the situation. And those of us that know the story very well, we all know what happened. When they put the fire in the senses and stood before the altar of God, we all know. God demonstrated that day who was truly the leader that he had chosen. So let's read verse 20 to 24 of 1 Chronicles 16, verse 20 to 24. It's 16, then the verse 20 to 24. 20 to 24. Mm. When they went from one nation to another, and from one kingdom to another people. Oh, did I say Chronicles? Mm -hmm. yeah. Sorry, we, we're still in Numbers. Sorry. So, number 16, 20, 24. So, the verse 20 and 24. Verse 20, it says, And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, Separate yourself from among this congregation, that I may consume them in a the moment. And they fell on their face and said, O oh God, the God of the Spirit of all flesh, shall one man sin, and you be angry with all the congregation? So the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the congregation, saying, Get away. From the tent of Korah, Theta, and Abira. Then Moses rose and went to Theta and Abira, and the elders of Israel followed him. And he spoke to the congregation, saying, Depart now from the tent of these wicked men, touch not, nothing of this, lest you be consumed in all their sins. So they got away from around the tent of Korah. That and Abraham. And that time and Abraham came out and stood at the door of their tent with their wives, their sons, and their little children. And Moses said, By this you shall know that the Lord has sent me to do all these things. For I have not done them of my own will. If these men die naturally like all men, or if they are visited by the common fate, of all men, then the Lord has no strength. But if the Lord creates a new thing, and the earth opens its mouth, and swallows them up with all that belongs to them, and they go down alive into, into the pit, then you will understand that these men have rejected the Lord. Now it came to pass as they finished speaking all these words, that the ground split apart under them, and the air for his mouth and swallowed them up with their household and all the men with Korah, with all their goods. So they and all those with them went down alive into the pit. The air closed over them, and they perished from among the assembly. Then all Israel who were around them fled at their cry, for they said, let the earth swallow us up also. And a fire came out from the Lord and consumed the 250 men who were offering incense. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Tell Eliza, the son of Aaron, the priest, to pick up the senses out of the place, for they are holy, and scatter the fire from the distance away. Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor. Uh, I'm not sure if you noticed something as she was reading 
a story. What did you notice about these rebellious guys? What do you notice about them? You see, when the spirit of rebellion takes over someone, and the person does not deal with it, it takes the person straight to the end. Even when God, you see, the, the, the heart of the leader, now listen to Moses here, God says, God becomes angry that the people have challenged the one that he has separated. And God says, you know what? Separate yourself from the congregation. Let me get rid of them. Then Moses says, you're not going to punish all of them for the sins of the few. But if you read further, you know or you notice that these 250 people had contaminated the whole communication. They had. And after they died, do you know that the next day, the congregation rose up and went to Moses' tent and told the Moses, you have killed our leaders. One day themselves saw fire coming from them. <laughs> to kill these 250 people. The next day the congregation attacked Moses and Aaron. They went straight to them. You are the ones who have killed our leaders. And when they did that, the Bible says the cloud of his presence quickly descended on the tent. And when Moses saw the cloud descended, he told his brother Aaron, Please do something now as a priest, or else all the people will die. And before Aaron could say Jack, a plague has started among the congregation, and people have started dying. So Aaron had to run, get the censer, put incense in it, and the Bible says that he stood between the living and the dead, interceding before the plague stopped. Now before it stopped, thousands of people, I don't remember exact figure, 16,000 are already gone. Dead and gone. Before the plague stopped. It is very dangerous for you to rise up against a person that you know that God has clearly anointed that person for this office. You call him for trouble. You call him for your own downfall. You call him for your own shame and disgrace. That is the spirit of holiness. That is why I told you in the beginning that the spirit of holiness comes with power. Don't joke with that spirit. If God's anointing is on someone and know that God's anointing, celebrate the person. Okay? Celebrate the person. Encourage the person. Let the person know that you are very good at this and I believe the Lord has anointed you to do this. Carry on doing what you are doing. Encourage the person. Don't go and stand in the way of that person. You are standing in the way of God. God is serious about this business. And God is not going to entertain you, one person, to be in the way to stop what he is doing. You are calling for death. Do you understand? Someone can sing, and can sing better than you. Oh, brother, sister, I can see this anointing on you. And carry the person to be in that position. So God has anointed him or her, and once he sings or she sings, God knows what he does as a result of the spirit upon him. God knows what he does in setting people free as they dance and rejoice in the Lord and as he sings. Do you get it? Don't stand, don't start, you know, 
working against that person, uh, I, I should also sing. I should also sing. I should also sing. Why is he the only person singing? Why is the only person singing? And you're going around telling people. I should also sing. What, what kind of? Please. Please shut the door. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. We are oh, I should also sing, I should also sing, I can also sing, blah, 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 please. He has been anointed for that office. When he says that he is tired, please, I'm tired, can you help? Then, you step in, okay? But don't go around undermining that person. Okay? Good. Let's read Jude chapter 1, verse 11. And then I'll give you the last quotations. And we'll go Jude 1, 11. And they perish in the rebellion of what? Korah. So that tells you that Korah is a spirit. And this is Jude 1 11. In the New Testament, Jude 1 11. The spirit of Korah. This one. Jude chapter 1. Then let me give you the verses for the results of rebellion. And then we'll finish. The results of rebellion. And that is Hebrews chapter 3, verses 7 to 11. Hebrews chapter 3, verses 7 to 11. And what does it say? Hebrews 3, verses 7 to 11. The results of rebellion. If someone rebels, what happens to the person? Let me ask that. <laughs> Verse 7 to 11. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hands, as in the rebellion in the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my works 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation, and said, they always go astray in their hearts. And they have not known my ways, so I swore, I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Amen. Amen. When they rebelled, God swore in His wrath that they will not enter His rest. Rebellion, the results of rebellion is death. Hmm? Let me finish with this story. I had a story of a guy who was in a church and this guy was causing so much problems in the church. And um, I was told there was this Jewish guy that entered the church one Sunday, stood at the back of the church, 
and blew the horn. He went into the church with the horn. He blew the horn and then left. The next day, that guy that was causing so much trouble in the church died. The guy died. And that's the result of rebellion. Instead of causing too much, if you think you don't agree with the church, leave the church. Leave. And, and then go. I don't try and stand in the way of what God is doing. He'll be calling for trouble. Okay, God bless you.